Russia and China have totally different ethical frameworks, and they are teaching the AIs that the duty of the citizen is to worship the state and the leader and the party, and that someone who reports their neighbor is a hero of the people, and free speech is not as important as proper, as correct doctrinal speech. These are utterly different values, and they would be all in the same ocean. I suppose I wanted to start by just asking how you are, because you've had this awful accident, haven't you? I appreciate your concern. Yes, it was unfortunate. I uh, I walked off a stage <laughs> in, in the most literal sense. Uh, um, like a cartoon character, I had two strides midair before plunging six foot onto concrete and uh, fractured my leg in a couple of places and my pelvis in four places, uh, which sounds really dramatic. And to be honest, it was. Oh, and, and some ribs as well um but with painkillers the dreaded oxycontin and uh physiotherapy i'm now exactly three months later uh pretty much fighting fit and did you worry about taking the oxycontin because it's got such a sort of you know i did very much so and i turned it down at first and then the consultant explained to me that it was uh, being given for the sake of the nhs that if i didn't take it i would uh lie in bed in terrible pain, which he didn't really care about. I mean, he was joking, but you know what I mean? He was making his point. Um, and I'd lie there for about eight weeks uh, and uh, taking up bed space. And then I would have a slow, slow period of physiotherapy, months and months and months and months and months. Whereas if I took the pill, uh, it's very Matrix-like, isn't it? Do you take the pill or don't you? If I'd taken the pill, um, which I did, um, I would be on my feet the next day, at least on crutches, groaning in pain, but just about manageable with a few screams. And then the next day, maybe a shuffle. And the day after that, even a tentative step, a turn around and a sit in a chair and, and so on. And that it would just reduce the recuperation period enormously. And that's a thing you don't think about with painkillers. Obviously, we hear the yeah. bad side of the opioid epidemic and how disastrous it's been. You know, what the de de deindustrialization didn't do to the rust belt uh, opioids did. Um, mm -hmm. and, and But we, we forget that it has an enormous role in, in healing uh, broken bones and so on, in, in allowing movement, which is the key, <coughs> so the muscles don't atrophy. And did you? And are you off off it now completely? Oh yes, I'm, yes, I was. I, I went off the, the, them as soon as possible. I found they weren't, frankly, much of a much of a buzz, much of a you know, much of a dreamy, exciting <laughs> feeling. They, they, they were rather disappointing. I, I became very, very itchy everywhere, and you, it was dreamy. But in my case, maybe it's my guilty conscience or something, rather paranoid and, and, and frightening dreams rather than beautiful ones. Yeah, because so so lots of nightmares then. I mean, quite apart from the fact that you were howling in agony a lot of the time. It just sounds awful. Yes. How did you get through this apart from the Oxycontin? Well, you know, the beginning of wisdom is that Solomonic phrase, this too shall pass. Um, we, we we do it to bring, bring ourselves to, to heal when we're too excited and everything's going too well. It brings us down, but it brings us up when things are ghastly. You know that the day will come. And the older you get, you I, you won't know this because you're so young but the older you get the more patient you get and the more you believe that things will pass you know you know when you're young and uh, a train journey or a boring car journey will never end another hour oh my god you know it, it, it's just terrifying how dull and, and unspeakable and torturous it is to wait for your birthday or to, to for a good thing to happen but the older you get the more patient you are it's, it's a thing i've noticed with some pleasure and in even uncomfortable feelings or boring waiting or or in this case boring and painful waiting for things to get better you, you just do know it will be over is it completely over? Are you completely back to normal? Well, no, not completely. My physio said to me, she said, uh, when I can hop forwards on one leg and then backwards on that leg, and the same with the other one, she will then she will leave me. That's that, I said that's your equivalent of Mary Poppins saying when the wind changes. <laughs> so I, that that's that could be three months away, but. Um, so it, it, the bones are mended, but it's the wretched tendons, particularly the hamstring and some of the muscles, the abductor and 
I get to know all these names. Well, you know, before I never had a hamstring. Yeah, you know, people, who, who knew? Only, the only people who have hamstrings are athletes. You know what I mean? They always go twang and, and normal people who stay in chairs and, you know, drink drink coffee and eat biscuits. They they never get a hamstring injury because they obviously don't have one. Apart from the Octocontin and the physio, did anything keep you sane during that time that you'd like to share with the world? <laughs> Well, reading, catching up with, uh, you know, the the obvious streaming things that uh, I hadn't caught up with, that everyone had told me I should watch, you know, whether it's White Lotus or Slow Horses or whatever. And, uh, and sure enough, you find they are as good, if not better, even than than, than advertised. Um, and and yeah, and books uh, and. Yeah, the, the, the ability to do that and not feel guilty, not not sort of rush and think, oh, I must put that away and, and get on with the real world. Enforced time off sick can be can be a bit of a luxury. It can. I mean, you're always told that we, we overdo it and we don't take enough pauses and that actually you're more productive if you, if you don't just do it all the time. Well, you were at the O2 giving a lecture on the perils of AI, which is something, the perils you've experienced firsthand. Tell us about that. Yes, I mean I, it wasn't on the perils of AI. I'm, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic about most things, and nearly always wrong. Of course, I was optimistic about social media <laughs> and, and the internet generally, and and obviously there is much to be thankful for in in certainly in terms of the um, the internet. But with yeah, it just so happened that about a year ago I got sent uh, a documentary, at least a part of a documentary on Dutch resistance leaders, which I narrated. And and I played it to the audience. I said, now, I'll, I'll play you this. This is me narrating the documentary. And then I'll play you the AI narrating the documentary. So I played me narrating the documentary. I said, now for the AI. Ha! I said, what you just heard was the AI. Ha! They all dutifully gasped because it was me. It was an AI voice based on the data set used were, were the seven... Uh, um, Harry Potter books that I narrated from the 90s onwards and that was enough to give a voice full range and most remarkably and I think the reason these people had chosen the Dutch resistance was there were Dutch names and German names Arthur Zeisinkwart and so on uh, Lorraine Mazel and, and names like that that are not in the Harry Potter world but it shows that this isn't just mashups where you just take a word from the from the corpus of of, of Harry Potter books and then just sort of make it into a language because that would sound awful. That would sound like a collage. Um, mm. uh, this this was a real voice with real intonations, and it, it fooled my family. You know, they thought it was me as well. My director at Channel Four News did a similar thing with all the presenters there and sort of cloned us. Um, so, you know, we're officially out of business now. It, it, it is it is a worry, obviously. I mean, those of us who occasionally make a, you know, make, make, make a little bit of a living from reading books and things. On the one hand, we can think, well, if they pay for my voice and they pay a handsome sum, then I can read the entire works of William Makepeace Thackeray in no time at all and be paid for it, which is a lot better yeah. than win -win. sitting in a studio having to go through them. But on the other hand, I I like the real experience of doing it. And obviously it is it is a worry, but it's the most minute worry in the whole story of AI. This is just a load of actors. Uh, trying to protect their job there are all kinds of people trying to protect their job paralegals radiologists and so on many 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 people whose jobs will be radically altered indeed the idea of work will be altered completely which shocks some people but then they forget how very recent the culture of work is in the human story you know you've only got to read your, your you know the popular books on human development to Noah Yuval Harari's and so on to 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 just be reminded of, of of how recent this idea is that we work that that is what we do that is what fulfills us and defines us it's what we are well except to you know tilling the fields was you know that's been around for a long time so you know that kind of work well the agricultural revolution is not very it's not very old um, it really isn't. Um, the hunter-gatherer is much, much older, hundreds of thousands, millions of years, depending on when you start the human race. Yeah, if but that was from, work. You know, the modern developments of tool making. Language is only 50,000 years old. That's language. And, 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 the, the, and the, the barley mother, as she's called, the, the, first, the first person to say, look, here's this seed. I tell you what, rather than just me eating it and then walking on trying to find another seed, 
just this piece is this is nice we're quite near some water and there's a nice little valley let's uh, pl plant some of these seeds and, and wait and build a little hut and then the you know the butch men say well you know i'll get i'll um, i'll protect you from other people who come and raid us and so on and so the hierarchies are those who till the field those who guard and animals are domesticated and so on but that's very recent it's not it's not, you know, we'd been human beings for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years before that, much longer than, you know, the the period from the, the agricultural revolution to now is much shorter than the period from our first tool making to the agricultural revolution. So, so again, we have to rethink what we think we are. And I think that's an incredibly exciting thing. But in the short term... My... Right, so what, what are we? What are we going to become? We, well, we, that's what we decide. That, that's the point. What would you we like that decision be... to be? What would you like us to fill our days with? And how would you like us to fund ourselves? The, the sneery remark you get from politicians is, oh, my God, we've all got to become poets, have we? Or, or potters. <laughs> or, you know, they, they sort of just picture that because there's no work left, all that's, all that's left is, is something creative. And that's going to be our destiny, which is not necessarily a bad one. But it will be, I suppose, more to do uh, with finding d different ways of being being together you know we depending which way you go from large to small or small to large we are family and and and, and we are clan and we are tribe uh, and then we are other groupings and and this other again totally mythical new idea a nation state which is so ingrained in us that we think it's somehow god given but is of course again preposterously recent and utterly meaningless in anything except our myth-making minds. Uh, famously, it's the first thing that astronauts observe and wonder at when they look at the Earth from, from, from space is how there are no boundaries. You know, hang on, <laughs> where does Canada begin and America end, they say, because they're mostly American. And the others look at Europe and go, whoa, it's just one place. That's all it is, one place. And so how do we organize ourselves and what sort of communities and so on and if we do have machines that are doing so much work for us and in therefore theoretically making us more prosperous the first idea that was put around you know 10 or 15 years ago and has been tried in countries like finland is known as the universal basic income where the the, the you know the extra money that comes from the work that the machines do uh, and the money saved uh, from training and, uh, and and so on of of, of humans in those works uh, is to give everybody an income which is really quite a big income enough to enough to eat and be housed and to be warm and to you know re really to have a full and perfectly okay life and what do you do then do you get bored <laughs> do you do you have to write a novel <laughs> it's a really interesting question I don't know the answer but my immediate concern I have to say Kathy and this is one I think you, you'll understand is when we look at the moment at the AI, we're really talking about these large language models, the, the, the things like chat GPT or chatty botties, as I like to call them. And the chatty botties uh, are, are amusing and so on. And you can look down on them. And there are famous phrases used, stochastic parrots and so on. But, it, but as I often like to say, you may say it's just a parrot, but parrots are miraculous <laughs> who who would ever go into a jungle or who who keeps a parrot in a cage whether that's a good thing or bad would ever say it was just a parrot they are miracles of nature and so in that sense are these chat gpts and similar lms um but what people are saying is look okay so these things scrape the internet the reason they can now exist is because the internet is so rich in data that you can have these machines that take all the data in the internet and they have enough nodes uh, to be able to process it but some of that data out there is very worrying it's lies or it's prejudiced we've taken hundreds of years to acquire a sense of all humanity being equal women being of equal value to men and people of all races being equal to each other and sexualities and so on and so on this is something we hold very dear so we must bake this into the into the AIs and you go, yes, of course, you're absolutely right. But hang on, <laughs> China and Russia have AIs and they're not separate. It's, it's like saying, oh, we must, uh, we must keep the Atlantic Ocean clean while everybody's 
peeing into the Pacific Ocean. They, they all connect. And so Russia and China have totally different ethical frameworks. And they are teaching the AIs that the duty of the citizen is to worship the state and the leader and the party, and that someone who reports their neighbor is a hero of the people. And free speech is not as important as proper, as correct doctrinal speech. These are utterly different values, and they would be all in the same ocean. So do you think that the, the government's AI summit that, you know, Rishi Sunak chaired before his recent woes do you think that was um a, you know a start in in dealing with some of these problems? oh yes it was very necessary to have it you know it's like the you know the ethics committees when first genetic engineering was a possibility and uh, and so on it was of course important to get government together with with ethicists and of course with the scientists to understand what's actually happening and there were some very important people at that time um, uh, at that meeting, people like Stuart Russell, who's a British uh, AI engineer and thinker, and um, they they understand really very clearly. And there were some rogues and you know that Elon bleeding Musk was there, of course. And uh, you know, you have to well, listen. Well, he's to him he's because, you know he's an, a central part. Of, of course, this world, he is. No, I'm not dismissing you know, he's the, his importance. The big daddy in this, of AI, both, you know, commercially in terms of his titanic power and reach, and uh, but his volcanic and strange and I don't know. I just don't know where he stands on anything. It seems to be getting worse and worse. But um, you, yes, you, 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 whether people like this seem to come out of science fiction or not, they are now real. <laughs> you have to face it. I mean, if I'd read a novel, I know when I was reading science fiction as a teenager or something, there would be some sort of strange entity of a, a billionaire who controlled both the satellites that gave power and protection to countries and could withdraw them at will um and but who also controlled you know cars and automatic driving cars and some vast network of information that he called x and you know you'd say well this is yes, amusing science fiction and, and here it actually is does it worry you in that context the caliber of of politicians around the world you know and the you know we're seeing these populist leaders emerge and other leaders not really having the sort of credentials to to um combat these titans it's a strange thing isn't it because what are the credentials to be a a, a politician you know so, so some of the most horrific uh, tyrants in history have been teachers like pol pot or so on you know is is being an intellectual a good thing to be a politician historically it doesn't seem to be it, it may sound like a good idea we may be pleased if there's a politician who is incredibly you know who's who really knows that aristotle and that spinoza or whatever but there's no uh, empirical evidence this makes a you know we may choose de Gaulle or Churchill or whoever it is, and there's an instinct, there's a, a certainly a, a rhetorical power, an oratorical power, even a, a gift of speaking and communicating, which is necessary, but that doesn't net always come with education. Some of the smartest people one knows are almost incapable of expressing themselves really in a, in a public space because they're too shy or whatever it might be, or, the, or they overdo it. They use too long words. They don't understand how to appeal to people um, directly uh, to, to their hearts and their brains in the way that someone like Churchill did. Or, um, so I, I, it's an interesting point, Cathy, but um, who am I to make some snobbish remark about, no, they're all absolute dross and they don't understand things well enough. Well, you know, I don't understand things well enough. Uh, to be a politician, I feel, and I, I'm hopeless at meetings. I'm not strong and tough at meetings. I wouldn't. I can't look at spreadsheets without feeling dizzy. You know. I mean, there are all kinds of qualities. You know, I, I often wonder. I did about you with politicians. You get these you know, people. They come from Eton, and you, know, you just think, oh, what an absolute pillock of a person. Um, but, and then they become, I don't know, they become chance of the exchequer and within a couple of weeks they're talking about cycles of the economy and supply side this and monetary that and fiscal that and and you think oh they seem to know what they're talking about because i couldn't really hold a conversation using all those phrases and words for more than about a minute without drying up now obviously they're brief well, you've, used, the you've used a few in this conversation <laughs> well, I'm just sort of remembering bits of phrases. Yeah. Anyway, look, we, we digress because <clears throat> you're here to tell me about your New Year's Day special of the, the UK version of the US quiz show Jeopardy, which you are hosting. And you got the job, didn't you, um, by, well, hustling, really. Tell us. <laughs> well, actually, no, by not hustling, strangely. Well, yes and no. I, I, I was in, about this time last year, I was in L.A., 
doing a, a, an Apple TV series uh, called The Morning Show. And uh, my American agent invited me to, out to, to a meal and uh, when I wasn't working. And, and he just friend, friendlily asked, you know, what are you up to? You know, what do you do when you're not working? And, and uh, I said, well, you know, I'm a bit of a homebody, really. I, I, you know, we don't like uh, Hollywood parties that much. We don't do, do that sort of thing. Or we'll go out to the smart restaurants to be pepperatzed. Um, you know, we one of us will cook and then we'll you know, watch Jeopardy. And Jeopardy being the quiz show that's been running in America since the mid-60s. It's an absolute institution in the United States. Everybody knows it. Everybody watches it. It's, it's just kind of incredible, really. Um, and so, you know, my agent said, oh, we love Jeopardy. And he talked about his, he and his wife watching Jeopardy and so on. And he said, do they have it in the UK? And I said, well, no, actually, they don't. It's a bit of a pity. I don't know why. And then the conversation moved on to other things. Two weeks later, he being an American agent and uh, nothing if not, you know, <laughs> full of chutzpah and get up and go, uh, he calls me up and says, oh, British TV are very excited about you doing Jeopardy. I said, I beg your pardon. <laughs> I don't remember <laughs> asking anything about that. I just said, it's a pity it wasn't. Oh, you don't want to do it? Well, I suppose since you mention it, um, well, let me have a think. And I have a think. I thought, well, you know, I really do love the show. It is, there's something magical about the format. And I just think if we could make it work in Britain, it would be a gift to the British people. They would be grateful It's because it's a, another thing to add to, to the pleasure of life. Um, and so I said, OK, well, I'll give it a go. And by coincidence, uh, the, uh, with the place where they shoot uh, Jeopardy every day is at the Sony Picture Studios in Culver City, which is where we were doing the morning show. So I got to, you know, went around the corner and I got a bog off deal. Yeah, and they were very incredibly friendly and supportive about the fact we were doing it in Britain. And the host there, Ken Jennings, showed me around, and I watched several shows being recorded and so on. Uh, and now we have a series which, as you rightly say, is starting on New Year's Eve on ITV and uh, then running every day, every weekday for five weeks, I think it is, the first season. It may be the only season, because if the British people don't take to it, because it is an unusual format, uh, and they might think, uh-huh. Um, I don't mean... <laughs> that makes it sound as if I think the British public is dumb. But, I mean, when I first saw it, I thought, uh, um, because... Well, they don't have question. Well, they have questions and answers, but not in the direction you would think. It's the contestants who give the questions. Hello. Oh. See, already you're going. What? <laughs> so. No, I like that. That sounds easier. No, because the, the, what you get is a clue. Now, let's say, don't blush. But this will really annoy you. But let's say the clue is. She was a Channel 4 TV journalist who did a famous interview with Jordan Peterson. Ah. Oh. No. All right. Okay. I knew it would annoy you. Okay. So, the. The, the contestant does not say, Kathy Newman. The contestant has to say, who is Kathy Newman? They have to phrase it as a question. Or if it's, you know... Oh, that's so weird. Yeah, it's a city with a famous harbour bridge and uh, opera house built by a Dane. So what where is, is Sydney? Sydney? Or where oh, is Sydney? Oh, what? okay, right. You can't okay. just say... Get in the uh, hang of it. Yeah. Apparently the reason is, because when people see it, they go, what the heck... A lot of people will know because there are some movies like Rain Man and uh, the Gra Groundhog Day that have very good Jeopardy scenes in them. But do you remember there was this scandal of the $64,000 question quiz show in the late 50s or early 60s? Uh, and they made a film about it. Robert Redford directed a movie with Ray Fiennes called Quiz Show. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the, that was one of the scandals, a bit like our coughing major, which made sure there was, there was real... Um, legislation laid down to 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 define what you know what's possible in a quiz show and to make you know to show that the there were real laws about this you couldn't cheat it was it was a, a absolutely like, like a bank or an insurance company it had to have really tight guidelines and merv griffin who was an american entertainer had had this idea for a quiz show and his wife and he said, "Oh my God, this whole thing about the questions not being shown." And his wife said, "Well, why don't why don't you make sure they don't have to answer questions? They have to give questions." So he said, "What are you talking about?" Apparently, her her example was, he lived at two two one B Baker Street with a doctor, and and he goes, "Sherlock Holmes." She said, "No, who is Sherlock who Holmes? is Sherlock Holmes? <laughs> that's just and, so anyway, bizarre." I, that's apparently how it all started. It seems a bit okay. Strange. Well, it's it's going to be great. It's New Year's Eve or New Year's Day? I was talking New Year's, New Year's Day. Day. You've said New Year's, New Year's Day. Day. 5.45 New Year's Day, ITV. right, okay. Yeah.
Right. Excellent. We'll all be watching. And I'm assuming it's going to be easy enough for us all to participate in our... Oh, absolutely. I hope everyone will be shouting at the screen. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> They'll probably be shouting, who is Stephen Fry? <laughs> well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Whoever you are, it's been a pleasure to talk to you Thank today. Thank you, Cathy.